You know how many shootouts I've been in, how many car chases I've been in, close to death, and to me it's nothing, you know what I mean? It's like normal to me, you know what I mean? And that's not normal. To tell you the truth, I look back at my life and I compare it to now, and I'd be like, yo, if I stayed on that path, I would have been dead or in jail. John's someone who's seen something in all of us that we didn't even see in ourselves. He got us helping people, meeting new people that we never meet before, taking us to new places we've never been before, and he's giving us a chance to provide for our families without having to worry. Like, he's creating that structure that guys look for when they come out of prison. Family. That's like a family, you know? Like, me just knowing that I have somebody on my side. I'll give my life for John. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll really give my life for John. This is how we do it, do it. This is how a kingdom comes. This is how we get it done. This is how we do it, do it. This is how a kingdom comes. This is how we do it, do it. Hey guys, welcome to a wet Boston, Massachusetts. Super excited about this episode. As most of you know, I grew up pretty rough. I grew up single parent, five kids, moved around quite a bit, had to live with family and friends uh, quite a bit early in my life. And you know, through that, you know, sport was something that I found you know, the sport of football and then through football I found the weight room and you know through the weight room I obviously found a career you know and so being a strength coach for me it was a calling it was something that um, I had to do because people coaches had made such an impact on my life uh, that it taught me lessons that I that I've carried through uh, to be a husband to be a father to be a coach and you know, today we get a chance to hang out with John Feynman. He's the CEO of Inner City Weightlifting, and it's an organization that, that takes at-risk youth off the street and introduces them to the weight room. And through the weight room, they, they can, you know, they, they find community, they find a network, but they, you know, for some of them, they find a career. And I think we can all relate to that. And here's a guy that's making an impact, the kind of impact that I think we all want to make in our athletes' lives, and so I'm super excited for this episode. Can't wait to spend the day with, with John. John, what's up, buddy? How's it going? Good to see you. Good to welcome. see you, man. Welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to come hang out with you. Excited to have you with us. Awesome, let's get out of this rain. Let's go yeah. check it out. So welcome to ICW, excited to have you here. And uh, yeah, this is obviously the weight room. Yeah, the, the, the quickest version of who we are and what we do, uh, we specifically work with young people who are at the highest risk for violence in order to reduce violence. And then through our career track and personal training, we're able to create economic mobility as our students start making $20, $60 an hour training our clients. Three, two, one, uh -huh. More important, what it does is that it bridges social capital and creates this really genuine form of inclusion that disrupts the whole system of segregation and isolation that leads to the streets in the first place. This is where the magic happens. You know, the, the thing that I'm dying to ask you is, that, I mean, you're not a big guy. What, what drew you to use the weight room to, to affect this social change? Yeah, I guess the answer starts with myself just growing up playing soccer. Um, I, I checked in freshman year, 5'2", uh, 118 pounds. Um, because I was an undersized athlete, I had to take weight training and, and my physical health seriously to be able to compete. Um, so my background kind of always had weight training and, and fitness 
as a core component. Um, when I graduated from Bryant University in 2005, I really wanted to stay involved in the sport industry. Uh, so I did a year of uh, AmeriCorps in this program called Athletes in Service to America. Uh, at the same time, I also started starting to become a personal trainer through NASM. And uh, two, two things happened. One, I ended up really enjoying personal training and, and, and um, just the science behind it. Uh, simultaneously, I was doing that year of AmeriCorps, I started working with a group of people in a gang called MS-13. Um, and you know, everyone told me, don't go near them, they're too dangerous, don't waste my time, they don't care. Uh, here I was this little white guy from Amherst, Mass, and, and by chance a soccer ball rolls my way one day, I do a couple tricks, kick it back, next thing I know I'm meeting Alexi, who was 12 at the time, um, getting initiated into the gang. I got to know him for who he was as a person. I think three things really stood out to me um, that year. Uh, one was the level of segregation isolation that he and his friends were facing, certainly in the obvious form, but also in this subtle form of not having a network to access or even be aware of what opportunities were out there. Uh, the second was this confusion between lack of care and lack of hope. So I have yet to meet anyone who wants to end up better in jail. And yet they're willing to lose their life to a bullet or jail to be there for each other, to support each other. So I saw this incredibly genuine form of care. So that wasn't what was lacking. What was lacking was hope. And that was kind of empowering because I felt like there's something I, and more importantly, we as a society, could do something about that. And a third piece, and, and, and I could not have articulated this at the time, but I definitely started to see the system that led me to getting my, uh, having this own kind of profound shift in my own perceptions to who Alexa and, and his friends were as people. Uh, I started seeing that weight training might be this opportunity to connect with them outside of my role as an AmeriCorps member. But at the age of 24, I just felt like I hit a ceiling. I loved personal training. Um, I had 56 sessions in my, my book every week, and I was kind of like, is this just it? You know, I, I love it, but Ultimately went back to Babson to get my MBA, went from Maycourt stipend, 120k year to 120k of debt. Uh, <laughs> best decision I've ever made, minus the one day a month when my bank account disappears because of student loans. Um, but that's kind of a very long-winded story of, of how uh, the idea of weight training um, was used to, to ultimately become a medium to, to give ourselves a reason to connect when everyone else is telling you to avoid. Going by a number of places that are, are kind of known as the, uh, the uh, this is like murder pan. Um, and the, tri the, uh, the triangle of death is what they, they used to call it. Um, this is where the, the vast majority of shootings and homicides were happening. I think that, that there's um, these two truths that exist. Yes, there is gun violence and, and street violence, uh, but at the same time, these are some of the best people I've ever had the privilege of, of getting to know, and, and, and those two things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, I think the more we realize that, the more we, we uh, have an opportunity at really creating change. We didn't even know this research was out there when we first started. I think we, we just knew we wanted to work with uh, the young people that were thought of as the hardest to reach. Uh, so we started off in some of the juvenile prisons for young people that were serving time for some of the most severe crimes and, and the more we got to know them and, and saw that the model was working and, and, and all of a sudden we got connected with some of their friends on the outside and we had a call from the police asking us if we know who we're working with and we're like, yeah, we think so. And, and then we get, uh, found that there's less than 1% of young people that were driving more than 50% of gun violence. Uh, at the time it was about 243, 246 people, today it's about 450 people in the city. And we were working with a number of people who were on that list, sometimes with our students who, as I've said before, who have been shot. So m more than 50% of our students have been shot, more than 90% have spent significant time in jail and have been arrested multiple times. Uh, and then the majority are also coming from uh, family incomes of less than $10,000. It's not as easy as offering an opportunity. Uh, it's, it, comes down to relationship building and, and really earning someone's trust. Um, so that, that's who we're working with, the 1% uh, of young people that drive more than 50% gun violence. Those early years when you were, you know, when you were going out and 
to meeting kids for the first time, you know, obviously I, there had to be some good stories, but there also had to be some some inter- interesting interactions to try to to try to form trust in a in a very short amount of time. Not being from the neighborhood, not no, not necessarily looking the same way either, you know. And so, what were some of those first emotions that you you experienced? And yeah, so we'll actually go by one of the parks. Um, but one of the stories that stands out to me, uh, you know, I'm walking this park uh, to meet with a couple of people that that I had previously met and. Kenny, um, who at the time was I think 14 years old, he was, he was like up to my thigh. Uh, is riding his bike and and comes up to me. This is before we actually knew each other. Goes, he stops right in front of me. Goes, were you the FBI? And then I hear his brother, his older brother Fernando, who I knew, go, nah, leave him alone. He's cool. And you know, next thing I know, the three of us are working out together in the community center. And and uh, you know, it's just like that. You get this connection that that starts with trust. You know, obviously, and I, you know, I talked to John a little bit about this as well, but I mean, there's, he walks into a room every single day that, that's got five, 10 guys in it that have been in jail once, twice, been stabbed once, twice. Yeah. You know, are you, are you ever concerned about safety or, or have a fear there as a wife? A little bit. Um... But yeah, I think I think early on when we were dating, I asked him the whole safety thing, and he he kind of blew it off. And <laughs> I mean, I think it really when you get to know the people for who they are. Absolutely. And I'm less concerned for his safety, and I've almost gotten to the point where I'm more concerned for the student's safety because that's sure. where the reality of you know kind of the violence and the danger lies. How proud are you of your husband? Oh my gosh, so proud. <laughs> All along the way, everyone calls me this great decision maker. In reality, I only have good options to choose from. Right. Then there's our students, born into families and communities that are segregated and isolated. Unlike myself, they have to worry about rent, they have to worry about food, they have to worry about utilities. There's no way that school can be your only focus growing up when those are the challenges you're facing each day. People grow up and they have, when they come home, they're normally worried about which TV shows are they gonna watch. You know, when we used to come home, it was worrying about what we eating for dinner. You know what I'm saying? So face going to the streets is like a real option. You know what I'm saying? I don't have time to go to school because I'm worried about what I'm gonna eat the next day or where I'm gonna rest my head, you know? And I'm only 14. You know what I'm saying? Like a normal kid would go home and worry about what show he's watching at six, seven. You know what I mean? I'm worrying about, yo, I gotta get these drugs so I can eat tonight. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's sad, but that's just the reality of it. Everyone calls them bad decision makers when in reality, they don't have a good option to choose from. John's someone who's seen some in all of us than we didn't even see in ourselves. I feel like he had like a plan for each and every one of us after like just a couple of weeks of meeting us. Like he knew what he wanted to do with each and every one of us. And he made all of us better people in a lot of ways that we didn't know. John, man, awesome opportunity to come hang out with you guys and just see the incredible impact that you guys are making. Th- thank you for coming and we couldn't be more appreciative of the opportunity. Oh man, this is awesome. Thank you. Your inspiration, thank you. appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. We should all strive to make the type of impact that John Feynman's making every single day. I think there's so many things to take out of this episode, but you know, two main things to me as a strength coach, here's a guy that in all intents and purposes doesn't, I mean, he's not the, the 250 pound, you know, ripped up, bald head, goatee, strength coach. Um, he's, you know, he's a guy that, you know, you look at him and he's, you know, uh, uh, grew up privileged and grew up in a two parent home and on the other side of the tracks and and yet has the courage to cross Massachusetts Avenue and, and go into situations and, um, and and has got that kind of courage because he knows that the weight room and, and sport unifies people and brings people together. And um, I think as coaches, we're, we have the opportunity to influence influencers. Uh, I really want to thank John for allowing us to come out. I thank his staff, his students for spending the day with us. Uh, make sure that if you're interested in supporting them that you go to innercityweightlifting.org. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways that we can support them as, as coaches. But appreciate those of you that like, share, and comment our episodes. It just helps us highlight great people like John and uh, promote all the great things that are, that are fantastic 
in our profession. Be sure to check back next month for another episode of Beyond the Chop. I'll give my life to John. He's a good dude, he held me down. Like everybody, everybody that's been here since the first day I came, even people that I've met, you know what I'm saying? Like everybody's been genuine, everybody's been real, and everybody's been supportive. So he's my boss, but it's, it don't even feel like that. It feels like he's my boy, you know what I mean? Like, to me, he tells me how much potential I got, and I feed off that. The truth, I look back at my life, and I compare it to now, and I'd be like, yo, if I stayed on that path, I would have been dead or in jail. So it has given me an opportunity to look forward to a better future. You know what I'm saying? And it, it gives me, I can see 10 years from now. You know what I mean? Seven, five, seven years ago, I couldn't see 10 years ahead of me. You know what I mean? Now I can do.